You're listening to School Counseling Simplified, a podcast with easy-to-implement strategies for busy school counselors. Here's your host, Rachel Davis, from Bright Futures Counseling. Raise your hand if you're ready to finally stop taking work home with you and actually start taking a lunch break. Or spend more time helping students, you know, the reason you got into this profession, and less time doing stuff like bus duty. And if you're ready to finally use data to showcase the importance of your program and the progress your students have made. If any of those things sound like you, then I have got the ultimate solution for you, and that is my stress-free school counseling course. Now, you may be thinking, wait, 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 you've talked about this before. I have. So my stress-free school counseling course used to only be launched a few times a year, but now it is available all year long and it is at a discounted price. This is perfect if you're the counselor who wants to work through it at your own pace. If instead of going through with a cohort and doing things together, you want to get to it when you can because you have a busy schedule. But first, let's see if you're even the right fit. Does this sound like you? You're a new counselor who wants to get started on the right track and not make mistakes and then redo things later. Or maybe you're a veteran counselor and you're feeling burnt out. Or maybe you're just a counselor who feels overwhelmed and stretched too thin. It's so hard to do all the things at once. Or maybe you're a counselor determined to change your program from reactive to proactive. Well, you're in the right place. Stress Free School Counseling is totally for you. It's a five module digital course. So what that means is you get to watch video modules of me talking to you just like I do here on the podcast and teaching you in different areas like scheduling, organization, data collection, advocating for your role and handling pushback. If this sounds like something you may be interested in, if you're a lifelong learner and can't wait to improve your counseling program, you're going to love this. And of course, it's stress free. Head over to stressfreeschoolcounseling.com slash enroll to get started today. Hey there, thanks for listening to another episode of School Counseling Simplified. I hope your February is off to an awesome start. We started off this month talking about individual counseling, and then last week we took kind of a detour to talk about National School Counseling Week, which I hope you had an awesome one. I can't wait to hear all about it. Um, And this week, we're going to hop back over and talk some more about individual counseling. But before we do, I want to share a review with you. So if you guys could leave reviews on the podcast, it means the world to us as podcasters. Um, These reviews are a great way for the podcast to rank higher in search so other counselors like yourself can find it. And just so you can share your thoughts on what you like and what you don't like about the podcast. Hopefully what you like, right? So I wanted to read one today. Uh, This is from Stacy. Stacy said, priceless. As a new elementary school counselor, much of my anxiety of the unknown was alleviated as I began to listen to Rachel's advice and expertise when it comes to counseling. I've gained a lot of useful information and tools that will put me on the right track to having a successful program. Her resources are a fabulous addition to reaching all students through multiple tiers. I highly recommend School Counseling Simplified. Thank you so much for the kind words, Stacy. I'll be doing little shout outs like this from time to time. So if you leave a review, you might hear your review on the podcast. Also, if you have another counselor who you think would benefit from this episode, I would love for you to share it with them. So send them the link so they can check it out as well, because the more counselors we can help, the better, right? Okay, so enough about that. Let's go ahead and dive in to this week's episode where I'm going to share with you how you can build genuine rapport in individual sessions beyond playing Jenga. (laughs) Okay, well, in all seriousness, I do love playing Jenga, and I just kind of use that as a joke because I feel like every counselor has that get-to-know-you Jenga that you whip out, and then everyone, you know, the kids pull it, and you're like, oh, we're building rapport. Uh, So I kind of use that as a joke because we're going to dive a little deeper here, but I, in all honesty, I do love a good Jenga game. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you know, Jenga is the stacking blocks game, and you can customize yours. You can, like, write on the blocks directly or like print on little pieces of paper and tape them to the blocks some get to know you questions so it's a fun way to get kids to open up in individual sessions um by playing a game but then at the same time they're sharing some deeper things about themselves it's just a little less awkward than straight up sharing it Um, so i do love good get to know you icebreakers like jenga and i do think these are so important when it comes to build rapport especially during that first session But that's not what I want to talk to you about today. Today I want to talk to you about four things you may not be doing that you can do to build rapport in your individual counseling sessions. 
Now, why we want to build rapport? Well, of course, we want to have a good rapport with all of our students, right? We want to have a connection with our groups, even the kids we're seeing in those class lessons. But with the individuals, it's a little more intimidating for the kids, right? They're in a one-on-one session with an adult. Maybe they kind of feel like they're in trouble. So we want them to feel comfortable um, and that they can trust us. Because in order for them to implement the strategies we're going to be working on with them, they need to have that level of trust. Okay, so the first way you can build a rapport with students doesn't even involve the students. I know, it sounds silly, but it's parent-teacher check-ins. So there's a few benefits to this. First off, you're learning how you can best support the student from all angles. So you're talking to the parents, seeing what's going on at home, um, what their struggles are at home, what they're doing well at home, and then the same for the teacher. Now, I love to get both angles. Sometimes it can be harder, you know, to get the parent contact and you kind of have to go an extra mile. Easier just to ask the teacher at lunch or something. But it really is worth it to go the extra effort and to get both the parent and teacher perspective because a lot of times student behaviors or student actions um, really vary in the class setting and in the home setting. So it's a really good way for you to get a full picture of the student's needs and how you can best support them. But you're thinking, okay, that sounds good. What does that have to do with building rapport? Well, a student may hear that you were doing these check-ins. They might hear their parent you know, on the phone with you, or maybe their teacher mentioned it, or they overheard something, and this is how they know you care, right? So you're like, oh wow, they're not only seeing me once a week in our sessions, they're asking my parents about me, and they're asking my teachers about me, and you can use this as like a get to know you thing as well. You know, find out what the student's motivated by. Find out some possible rewards that the student would like to work toward. Those are great ones, especially if you're dealing with behavior challenges. Um, instead of starting from square one and trying to use just a you know, one size fits all behavior reward strategy, instead you can do a personalized strategy. So you can find out from the teacher or the parent, the student's interest and likes, and how you can use that to help motivate them to reach their counseling goals. Okay, number two, student check-ins. So we just talked about parent-teacher check-ins, but what about checking in with the student themselves? Now you might be thinking, I have no room in my schedule. It is packed to the max. And I know how you feel. I actually have a lot of episodes on scheduling and a lot of stuff on the blogs um, about that as well. I even have my stress-free school counseling course where I have a whole module on scheduling. We'll link to all that in the show notes because I know it is so tough to squeeze it in. So you might be thinking, I don't have any room for more check-ins. But I'm not talking about another scheduled session. I'm talking about in addition to your, let's say you're meeting once a week for a half hour. That's not very much time, right? So in addition to that once a week for a half hour period, you can do check-ins if you're in the hallway and you see the student. So these are unplanned, but anytime you see that student on campus, make a point to go over, say, hey, how's it going? Obviously, you don't want to embarrass them if they're with a group of friends or something, but just kind of check in. You know, you're not going to be like, oh, can we uh, touch base on that super confidential thing you shared with me the other day? We're not trying to trigger anything or bring up any um, strong emotions that they may experience outside of your office, but it's just a good way to say, hey, how's it going? Or um, how'd that your cousin's piano recital go? Or how'd your soccer game go? Or isn't, uh, didn't you get a new puppy? Or, you know, whatever. Just try to remember something that they told you, and then you can bring that up when you see them around campus. Another way you can do check-ins is through observations. So just kind of observe them at the playground or at the cafeteria or maybe even in their classroom just to kind of see how they're implementing the strategies that you're working on. So while in this method you're not exactly talking to the student, you're more observing them, it's kind of like my first strategy where they can see that you're there so they know that you care. They're like, wow. Miss Rachel's checking in on me, you know, like she's really invested in that I'm how I'm doing. She really cares about how I'm doing, you know, in school and how I'm doing in at recess. The morning time is specifically a great time to do these check-ins. So if you're doing a bus duty or like car rider line, or if you're somehow involved in the morning routine, maybe once a week, make an effort to find that student and just tell them, hey, hope you have a great day. So this isn't really, you know, a thorough check-in. You're just letting them know that you care, you're there, and you hope they have a great day. We want them to know that they have your support all the time, not just during that one 30-minute block. And they might just say, hey, cool, hope you have a good day too. Or they might say, hey, I really want to share this with you. So you're just letting them know that you are available and you're there with them, which is a great way to build rapport. 
Now for my third strategy, this one kind of has to do with the check-in. So I was saying if you see the student on campus, you can kind of bring up something about their personal life that you know, you know, hey, how's that going? So my third strategy for you is take an interest in their hobbies and personal life and write it down if necessary. So you have a ton of students. You probably have a really big caseload, right? I know it's hard for me just to remember names, much less people's like personal situations, especially when you're just getting into it. Once you've been a counselor at the same site for a few years, you start to know kids and families and you see them progress through the grade levels, it gets a little easier. But I know if it's your first year, this can be kind of crazy. So write it down. It's okay if you have to jot a few notes. Obviously, we're not writing down super confidential things. But if you have a session with your student and they share something personal, like, you know, it doesn't have to be deeply personal. Maybe something like, oh, my cousin's visiting um, from New York and going to stay with us for the week. You could just make a note, cousin visiting. Then next time you see them in your session, you can say, hey, how was that trip with your cousin? So, of course, you could do this in those check-ins as well, like I mentioned. But this is something you can start off your sessions with, is a check-in, a personalized check-in to let them know that you care about their hobbies or their personal life, what they like to do for fun. And this can always spark deeper conversations or at the surface level, it's just a way to let them know that you care and you show an interest in them outside of just the confines of their counseling goals, right? We never want students to feel like they're a problem or that they're in counseling because something's wrong with them. So we don't always want to be like, okay, hey Sarah, how's it going? Have a seat. Now let's talk about those self-regulation strategies. Like it's like, whoa, pump the brakes. I'm a human too, you know? So we want to connect with them first and say, oh, hey, Sarah, how's it going? And they're kids. So they might be like, fine. They're likely not going to, you know, dig super deep. And you can do your feelings check, everything. Maybe that'll give a little insight. But sometimes it helps if you have a starting point for the conversation. Like, oh, how did your basketball game go last week? Or is your mom's knee feeling better? I know you mentioned she was having some problems with it. Then you can kind of start a deeper conversation and they're like, wow, Miss Rachel has all these students and she remembered me and she knows everything about my life. She must really care about me. Again, that's building that trust, which will ultimately help in them progressing to their counseling goals. Okay, my last tip I have for you is you can customize your curriculum to fit their needs. So you can do this a couple of ways. Maybe you are buying a curriculum like on TPT or maybe your school's provided you with a curriculum like you have some books already and you're thinking, how can I customize that? So you might already have a set thing you're using, but you can just do little tweaks to meet the student's needs. So for example, I love to use a progress chart to track sessions. So a progress chart or a progress tracker is a great way for students to see how many sessions they've completed and how many they have remaining. So this helps them have a little closure at the end of the session so they can anticipate what's to come next. Now you could just do this as a simple sticker chart or something generic that you use with everyone, but you could also customize it to fit their needs and interests. So for example, um, let's say, like I had some little kids who were really into Paw Patrol. So I did, this was with a group I think, but you can do this with an individual as well. For our progress tracker, every week we got like a Paw Patrol sticker specifically. So that meant a lot to the kids because that was something they were interested in. Not counseling related, but it's just something that they like, so it makes them take more interest in the sessions. If you're someone who likes to DIY everything and if you're designing your own activities and your own games, then you can get super creative with this and really customize it to fit the individual student's needs. Something we really want to be mindful of all the time is that if we're using something with characters, whether it be a book that we're selecting or a game that we're playing or a social story that we're using, it's really important to use characters that reflect the student you're working with so it's more relatable. So for example, students like to see characters that look like them. So for example, if you just have a fair-skinned, blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl that you're using in all of your examples, whether it be in a book that you're reading or a dice game you're playing, that's not going to be very relatable to your students of color or to your male students. So you want to make sure that you're being really intentional about selecting resources that reflect that student's identity. That way they feel accepted. And this might not be something that, you know, they recognize or say right off the rip. They might not say like, oh, that looks like me, but they notice these things. Students definitely notice like, wow, we've been reading all these books and none of these students look like me. 
So this is definitely something we want to be mindful of. I love doing this with a social story as well, not just looks, but actions. So I love coming up with social stories about students and then playing like a little dice game to um, reflect on them. So for example, I'll write a story. Let's say we have a student who's struggling with self-esteem. I'll write up a little story about a character and I'll put a picture of a character. And the story would be something like, oh, this is Brene. Brene's day was going great, but then this happened. So then Brene felt horrible about herself. And then this happened. And then this made her feel even worse. And then this happened. And this made her feel even worse. And by the end of the day, Brene felt like she was worthless or something. And then the dice game would say, like, have you ever felt like Brene? What could you do to help Brene? If you were Brene's friend, what advice would you give her? So this does a couple things. It's a cool way to externalize the feelings of the student. So when you're writing these up, you can personalize it to fit that student's needs. So use examples that are really similar to their life. So you know because they're telling you what they're struggling with in counseling, and you can then use that information to kind of incorporate it into the curriculum. That way you're making it super relatable. So that's my last tip for you. Customize that curriculum to fit their needs, whether it be a simple progress chart or if you're actually creating social stories with characters that look like them, this is a great way to make them feel valued and to build genuine rapport. Okay, guys, I hope you found those four strategies helpful. Again, I'm not knocking on Jenga. I think you should keep doing that as well. But these are just four things I thought you maybe weren't doing that you can start doing to really build those deep relationships in individual counseling sessions. If you're looking for more help with individual counseling sessions or you're like, those social stories and stuff sound awesome, but I have no idea how to make those, I've got you covered with my new individual counseling curriculum. So it covers 11 different topics. We'll link to it in the show notes. And it has all of the um, activities and games that you need along with data tracking tools and parent assessment tools, things like that. So I hope you love it. I hope you found this episode helpful. Uh, Please reach out to me on Instagram at Bright Futures Counseling. I'd love to connect with you and I will talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to School Counseling Simplified. You can find the links from today's episode in the show notes. If you'd like to connect with Rachel, she's on Instagram and Teachers Pay Teachers at Bright Futures Counseling. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes of School Counseling Simplified. Talk to you next week.